Namaskaram. Lavina, Namaskaram. welcome to you. Yeah. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. <laughs> Namaskaram, Smriti Ji. Namaskar and good Namaste. evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Lavina Valdota, and I feel very privileged to be hosting this session with two stalwarts who have represented Indian heritage in many ways around the world. And today, on the sixth National Halloum Day, we'll be talking textiles, technology, and teamwork, and what it means for the future of India's indigenous wealth. I myself have been deeply involved with the cause of Indian artisans, crafts, and their future for more than two decades. And as a part of this journey, I curated Santati, a multidisciplinary exhibition that commemorates 150 years of Mahatma Gandhi. Weavers, designers, artists came together for this show that revealed the possibilities of a rich interface of art, design, crafts, and textiles. The knowledge and the skill that we have in India can be a shining example for the world. As I aspire to see Indian textiles become sought after worldwide, I find our artisans today in the most challenging times. Let's talk about how we can all come together to make things look upward and forward. I welcome today's guests, the Honorable Union Minister of Textiles, and for Women and Child Development, Smriti Irani Ji, and the yogi, the mystic, the trailblazer, Sadhguru. Namaskaram Sadhguru, Namaskaram Smriti Ji. Namaste. Namaste. More than two decades ago, at the Miss India pageant, she said she was interested in politics. From a model to an actress, to a minister in the Union Cabinet of India, Smriti Rani's journey has been truly awe-inspiring. It clear, clearly reflects immense clarity of thought and purpose, as well as her steadfast diligence. This dynamic leader is a firebrand, a game changer who has taken the country by storm. Her solidarity as a politician, a parliamentarian, and a people's person has won many a hearts, making her a role model for women. In fact, she was featured as one of the world's most inspirational female figures at U2 concert in Mumbai last year. She has also been awarded the Young Global Leader of India by the World Economic Forum. As a textiles minister, her contribution to the sector through revival, reform, restructuring, and digitalization has been exemplary. Her efforts have given a new boost to the previously neglected textile regions like the Northeast. The Samarth scheme, the launch of Handloom e-portal, and her appeal of commerce with compassion gives us all hope for a brighter future for Indian handlooms and textiles. Personally, I have experienced how easily approachable and affable she is, along with being such a taskmaster. Her prompt and efficient actions, her result-oriented approach, and her valuable guidance is truly unparalleled. I still remember how the textile and fashion fraternity joined me in rejoicing when Smriti Ji was reinstated as the Union Textile Minister. Sadhguru, the master, the visionary, the humanitarian, is also a youth icon and a style icon. He has been <laughs> an ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> he has been an ambassador of Indian weaves, who has, who with his sartorial style and sensibility, has glorified Indian textiles. Last year, Sadhguru launched Save the Weave initiative to raise visibility and awareness about the art and science of eco-friendly Indian weaves. He also championed Fashion for Peace in New York, where top American designers used Indian textiles to create their collection. Sadhguru has always emphasized on the use of natural fabrics for one's mental and physical well-being, and how weavers use their hands and hearts creating a cloth which is an outpouring of their being. Sadhguru, the ultimate alchemist, touched my life, inspiring and propelling my journey. His grace and guidance has turned my thoughts into action, giving purpose to my passion, especially in the field of textiles and crafts. In gratitude, I cherish his esteemed presence at the inaugural launch of my exhibition, Sadhguru, in Mumbai. I look forward to this conversation between the two doyans of Indian textiles, the Honorable Minister Smriti Rani Ji and Sadhguru. I'm sure 
this synergy will be a tale of new possibilities that will benefit many. Over to you, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. Uh, well, <clears throat> as I said earlier, see, in many ways, uh, if you look through the millennia, nearly 40 to 50 percent of India's population were involved in making of the cloth, making of a fabric, growing the, uh, f you know, the, uh, uh, the fiber and spinning and weaving and dyeing and variety of things. Every region has its own variety of handloom. So unique and uh, you, be, you being in Karnataka, you must know, there are such unique things that when I actually, you know, I've traveled extensively in the country, not from airport to airport, like I've been on road, literally at one time on, <laughs> on two wheels, and like I've seen all kinds of things, and my interest in textiles naturally took to those centers also. In Karnataka, there is a place called Gullet Gudda. You heard of this, Lavina? Very close to where I live. Uh, Smritiji, you must also know probably, but for most <laughs> people wouldn't know this, this entire village and this region is focused on just producing one particular type of blouse uh, textile. They only do the blouse, only that whatever three-fourths of a meter or one meter, whatever it takes, uh, just that, that is all they weave. And it was so amazing that I spent some time with these people. How, see the, the power of involvement, what it does when somebody puts their life into something as simple as just one piece of fabric, which will go into people's use, and how they've evolved that, it's very, very difficult to replicate that anywhere else, what they have done. It is so unique and so fantastic. So like this, the, in every place that you go, there is a different weave and different style of doing things, which all developed individually. We must understand it takes millennia, many millennia, to come up with this kind of craft and skill and ingenuity. But uh, in the name of modernity, from the time of Manchester's uh, <laughs> manipulations to today, the Chinese inputs, we are going towards everything, mass production, machine-made stuff. I am not against machines, I am not against industrialization, but uh, what is done with human hand has a certain aesthetic, has a certain beauty, has a certain uniqueness, and above all, it's a human expression. It, the most important thing for a human being is when it comes to inner way of life, we want to have the most profound experience possible. When it comes to the world, how can we impact life around us? This is all that really matters. Whether we weave or cook or speak or work, essentially we want to see how much impact. So, this... Le these dedicated hands, which have given themselves absolutely to cause that impact, to cause that simple sense of pleasure for somebody unknown who will buy this and wear this is a fantastic human expression. Unfortunately, between 1800s and 1860, mm, uh, I think millions of uh, hand weavers committed suicide or died of starvation because of the East India Company's policy of those days. But that is over. This is now an independent India. Here, we have to bring back the hand weaver in a big way because as it is, it's a big employer, the second largest employer next to agriculture. But we need to get this more integrated into our culture. We have all gone machine-made. Most Indians don't know, first of all. The worst thing is, we do not know we have a fantastic heritage of evolving variety of textiles that you cannot imagine possible. No nation, no culture ever has come up with so many varieties of textiles it's truly fantastic. Making it live and making it prosper is definitely the goal. And uh, we have a very dynamic and uh, superbly articulate minister. Uh, there's no better person to convey the message to the world in ma many different ways. But uh, we are all with uh, the cause. So please, uh, Smriti, you can say uh, what is the fundamental things that are being done. I know there are a whole lot of things. One thing I want to complain to or complain about you is uh, you're coming up with names that South Indians cannot pronounce. What is this? <laughs> Hath, Hathgara, Samvardhan, Sahayata, 
Most South Indian viewers cannot pronounce the thing. Please come up with simpler names for us. <laughs> so, in short, Sadhguru, it's HSS. <laughs> <laughs> Please, if you can... Uh... I'm extremely blessed to be on the same platform as you, Sadhguru. Given <laughs> our parampara and our swabhav, what we are taught by our elders, is that we never sit on the same munch as a guru. Digitally today, I have breached that protocol for which I convey my regrets at your feet. For me, that's a very, very uncomfortable situation. For I never thought that it is fit for me to sit at the same position as a guru, as a yogi, as celebrated, such as your kind self. Sadhguru, you've highlighted our historical approach towards weaving, but the way you have conveyed the artistic and human expression behind the weave is something that needs to be understood. You spoke about just one city, one village dedicated to weaving of a blouse. I look at it from the fact that these are weavers who pursued perfection in detail for just one element of a larger scheme of things. And I think that we are today blessed with a variety of weaves. Today, we have 1,500 handloom clusters across the country in 400 districts. The fact that they still exist is because of this pursuit for perfection, because of this love for craft, because of the human story behind each Tana Bana. And when you talk about the disconnect with the youth, when you talk about the disconnect with the modern markets, I think that's where the challenge lies. To dial back a little bit, Sadhguru, you spoke about the industrial impact on the weave of India. You rightfully spoke about an era where the Indian textile industry serviced the entire clothing requirements of the world. But we need to recognize that it was at a time and place where cotton and muslin ruled the world. Slowly as we progressed, and as you rightfully said, Sadhguru, as we modernized, we became more and more plastic in our approach with regards to our clothing. Today, the world over, though in the handloom segment, India exports and actually services 90% of the world's handloom market the harsh reality is that as a garment, 70% of what is worn around the world is made of man-made fiber, which has either a plastic or a viscose base. So a country which has been living a legacy of cotton, jute, silk, for it to transform itself to international market needs which are predominantly based on plastic, that is where the challenge first emanates. When you speak of the young Sadhguru and how can we connect more with them with regards to the weave legacy of our country, I had the opportunity of engaging with a few to ask them, how can we make the handmade cloth more acceptable to the young? There is one who said, it's very harsh on the skin. They could not, in fact, differentiate with the fact that when they wear a plastic-based fabric, their skin could not breathe. There were some who said, Iska color bohat jata hai. And the Honorable Prime Minister in 2015 announced the India Handloom brand. Sadhguru, the premise behind the launch of the brand was to ensure that more and more of our weavers can connect with the younger customer, with the international customer. One of the emphasis under the brand was to ensure quality to the customer. And when we went deeper into the fact as to why the color runs out of so-called handloom cloth, there was a discovery that when you use chemical dyes and colors, it is but natural that the natural fiber base and the chemical color would never meet. And that is why when we look at our handloom history, we look at the role 
that you as as you said sadguru in your opening remarks we look at the role that our farm community our forestry community had to play in the evolution of the weave in the evolution of the cloth and the pattern the fact that weaving was not limited only to the loom but was actually a reflection of a life cycle of a community is something that needs to be again studied and resurrected so today i'm happy to share with you that under the india handloom brand sadguru we have over 1800 products registered 184 product categories to be precise and now we are appealing to people who are in the commercial segment big brands such as biba arvind to come together with the weavers and source their cloth directly from the weavers thereby bringing about that synergy that was long absent but you're right sadguru how can we encourage more of the young to conjoin with our efforts one of the i think takeaways from the digital india campaign as enunciated by the prime minister was if we want to engage with the young can we ask them to look at design prototyping online can we look at ensuring that we create tourism opportunities around our craft and handloom villages and with the guidance of the honorable prime minister sadguru today on the 6th national handloom day we announced 10 such craft and handloom villages one of the first villages that we announced support for in collaboration with the state government was a village called sharan in the state of himachal pradesh we recognize that not only is the beauty of the indian handloom spoken of the world over but there is also an inherent curiosity about how that weave came into being or came was breathed life into and looking at that tourism possibility now we are working at 10 special places with states to ensure that we create tourism opportunity which will help engage the young from the weaving community to this particular vocation but as you indicated sadguru this is just one of the first steps there is a long way to go and success can only be achieved when this becomes a people's movement uh i must tell you my experience of uh, the ingenuity of how uh, hand weaving happens uh when i was uh, just around 20 years of age or 21 years of age when i was determined not to educate myself for any particular qualification <laughs> i was just exploring the world my father was very concerned uh, said go and uh, look at the silk industry because uh, a whole lot of families in our community were involved in silk weaving so just out of uh, simple curiosity i just went there to see how uh, you know the mysore silk sarees were being hand woven in a particular area i went and sat there because the, i'm saying this because the general impression of probably the modern or educated youth is these things are being done by people who are brainless people otherwise you would be in the university you would be doing something else i went and sat there and when i was 21 i really believed i'm smart not anymore okay at that time <laughs> i believed i'm very smart you're wise now <laughs> <laughs> realizing that i'm not smart okay <laughs> so i went and sat there in an afternoon and i couldn't take my eyes off this guy for more than 2 hours because he was doing some magic with his hands and like that a flower comes up here another flower here perfectly geometrically correct and there is no computer there is nothing guiding him everything is in his head he simply just producing magic then i decided i don't have enough brains for this one and i stepped out of that <laughs> i'm saying it's so incredible because from childhood they're involved in this so this was one concern because you're also the minister of uh, women and child welfare uh, i don't know she lavina said it's development i don't know if it's been renamed is it development or no, welfare no no it's still development okay <laughs> so uh, because of that i'm Once saying they develop sadguru they can look <laughs> after their own welfare <laughs> yes so uh, we must distinguish between what is apprenticeship and what is child labor 
unfortunately, this activism about child labor, I'm not saying uh, children should be put to work, uh, definitely not. But the activism about child labor mixes up what is apprenticeship, what is learning process, and what is labor. So if in the education policy right now, I see fortunately there is some occasional aspect wherever it is necessary, that's a very positive step, but still for all schools to equip themselves to deliver that may take some time, but at least by intent we are moving in that direction, it's a good thing. But uh, in some way can you say in policy how we can differentiate apprenticeship from child labor? Sadhguru, that's a very, very thin line that we always walk. I think that as a mother of two kids, I recognize the need to teach my child a craft. That too, a craft that is, uh, that is something that I'm beholden to as a part of my legacy, as a part of my culture. But we also recognize that there have been instances, many in fact, where people have misused the law or the purpose of teaching to ensure that children are thrust into very, very abject form of bonded labor. And I think given that we are a very conscious society that wants to ensure that while we teach the craft, we do not bind that child to labor. I think that is a conscious and a very deliberate line that we all have to delicately balance in everyday practices. I think that Sadhguru, one of the greatest joys one can get, and I reminisce from my visit to your ashram, uh, is when communities come together and teach their young what their legacy is. Nobody can misinterpret that as labor. And I think when communities and families come together, those are the instances that stay with a child forever. A grandmother who used to teach you how to stitch without it becoming a gender justice issue. A grandparent who would teach you, and Sadhguru rightly, can we look at new processes of creating new kind of natural fiber or fabric? A grandfather who could possibly tell you that can we look at how the banana peel can be used to make fabric? Or parents who would tell you the beauty of the bamboo and how we can actually generate cloth out of bamboo. So I think that if we can encourage more and more families and community learning processes of these skill sets, we will stay away from the danger of shoving our children into aspects of labor. I also feel, Sadhguru, there needs to be a, a kind of a encouragement given to studying and researching about our legacies, especially with regards to our crafts and our looms. You, given your travels, not only across the country, but the world over, are very rightfully positioned, Sadhguru, to enlighten a lot of families about the craft legacy of their own districts, of their own states. How many of us take the pains of teaching our children about the craft legacy of the states or the districts that we belong to or the village that we belong to? In terms of transference of skill, can we begin from there? And you're very right, Sadhguru. The magic on a loom is something which can never be expressed in words, which can never be quantified through technology. Because as so here, it's so difficult to come together with so many threads, with the history of patterns and design, and still come out with a unique piece of cloth every time. The principle behind, I think, not understanding the beauty and the intricacy of the loom and the skill set behind it possibly emerges from two prospects, one of ignorance and the other of arrogance. And I think, Sadhguru, when we approach a weaver with a sense of humility and a desire to learn, I think we come back enriched. So if thought leaders and yogis such as you bless families so that we are encouraged to take these lessons to each child, I think that the revolution that we all hope for is a revolution and a change which will not be far behind. Uh, you know, that is very true, uh, Smriti. I very much appreciate that uh, thought. But at the same time, uh, these are times where uh, the excitement of technology, what happens on the screen, 
is more interesting than anything that can happen in the world. When that is the thing, unless something is made lucrative, people's investment of time may not happen in anything, however beautiful and fantastic it is, whatever historical significance and even, uh, uh, you know, cultural and legacy significance it has, it won't live unless it has a lucrative element to it. So having said that, these unique weaves and designs that exist in every part of this, uh, at least if we recognize a few things belong to a certain state. Is it not a good thing that by policy, we bring this into the country, that let us say if you are in a particular state, whatever the handloom legacy that is there in that state, whoever uh, gives a boost to it in terms of, let's say, hospitality industry, school, school uniforms, all these things, if they take to this, they will get some tax benefit or some other kind of economic benefit must be given to them, so that suddenly what is a niche consumption can become reasonably mass consumption. Especially children, it is a crime to wrap a child in a polyfiber. You do that to dead fish, not to living children. To our children, we should not do it. This is one of the worst things that you can do, but almost entire children's clothing in the world is fully polyfiber. Especially, especially a child's body is very vulnerable to this. Both their physical and psychological well-being is impacted by uh, polyfiber entering into their system. To what extent means? See, probably this is only studied in United States, so the numbers and stats are available. They're saying an average American has 28 grams of polyfiber in his body. Because polyfiber has entered our body, polyfiber has entered the uh, soil, has entered the water, has entered the whole food cycle, and it is getting into us. These 28 grams in an American person, maybe 10 grams in an Indian person, we don't know what is the percentage, but whichever way, this polyfiber which is sitting in our body is definitely not doing good to us. How much is this a cause of cancer, other ailments, whatever liver, kidney problems that people are going through all over the world? There are no studies to show us this, but definitely it is not nourishing us, it is not creating well-being for us, and wrapping our children in this kind of fiber is a crime. So one thing we can do is by policy, at least the government schools can start initially, and then we can encourage the private schools that school uniforms must be natural fiber, if possible, handloom, but the style and uh, the design should be belonging to that state so that this will live on actively. And when in their young age, when they wear this and they appreciate it and they know the value of it, they will naturally, when they become youth and citizens of this country in, or in the world future, then they will continue, to, uh, continue that legacy for sure. So if uh, this can be taken with the schools, with the hospitality industry, which welcomes tourists from around the world, uh, wherever possible, if we can bring this, uh, some kind of economic benefit for people who promote this, it would make a huge difference. I totally agree, Sadhguru. As always, you inspire us with new ideas and new thoughts. And I think that this is food for thought, especially given the federal structure of our country. It is an issue where states can be encouraged and appealed to, to ensure that more and more such products become a part of everyday life. In fact, Sadhguru, when it comes to school uniforms, uh, as somebody who had served in that particular segment earlier, I believe most of the cloth that the child wears is uh, not cloth which is of uh, man-made fiber. But yes, there can be a definite encouragement given to natural fiber, especially for use by children. I also feel that given that sustainability is the new buzz in the fashion industry, more and more of our young, more and more of our customer base can be encouraged to embrace natural fibers. But I also believe, Sadhguru, that diversification opportunities for the industry, and especially the weaver, needs to be explored. Because for too long, market intelligence with regards to evolving needs and design needs of the customer is something from which the Viva has always been distant. And I think today, given technology and conversations such as this, we can in fact encourage our weavers to understand better the needs of the market. 
Sadhguru, I must here also confess that given the Prime Minister's clarion call to ensure that there is transparency in terms of opportunities made available, I'm sure that you know of the GEM portal where the government, including state governments, are encouraged to procure directly from citizen entrepreneurs. And I'm happy to share with you, Sadhguru, that through the Ministry of Textiles, we actually today have 50 lakh handloom and uh, artisanal database that we are uploading on the uh, GEM portal so that governments at the national level or the state level, or for that matter, the district level, can make their procurements directly from the weaver and the artisan, thereby expanding new opportunities for them and cutting away the role that middlemen have played for decades. That is a very important step that uh, creating uh, marketing platforms like that is vital. But I was just thinking, uh, please, uh, I mean, put your people through this works. Uh, one thing is to come up with innovative marketing ideas and design ideas, which I don't believe, uh, I'm sorry if <laughs> this is not in depreciation of the government, but uh, I don't believe government agencies can do that by any standards. It needs somebody who is actively involved in commerce, design, who is uh, hands-on with that stuff, which is largely the corporates. For example, if we give freedom for the businesses, whether it's existing businesses or new businesses, particularly let's say, let us say we take ten designers who are of some repute and uh, give them this idea that now this particular state, this type of handloom, if you design things with this, whatever products you make out of it, this will go tax-free, you will get this benefit, that benefit, whatever benefits and uh, marketplace, uh, you know, little uh, stepping stones they will get. I think these designers who have... who are immersed in that business, who know what to do, they may not know how to weave a cloth, but they know what people's trends are, what will be bought in the market, how to reach international markets, all these things, they are well versed. There are many, many Indian designers who are very competent in the international market. If we give them... see, without financial uh, impetus, these things won't work. I don't believe just by philosophizing about it, it's going to work. This is... this may be an aesthetic dimension to our culture, but it has always been uh, successful because of its commercial value. Without commercial value, people will not invest their lives into it. There are very few people who will do things, uh, maybe like you and me, uh, who are willing to do things just for the love of something, and of course, Lavina is there. She will do everything for the love of it because she doesn't need the money. But uh, all the others who are in commerce, we will... they will invest their life and time into it only if there is a commercial value. So I'm just saying as an idea, if we identify uh, probably designers who come from those states and say, if you promote these... if you use these handlooms and promote these handlooms, whatever you manufacture out of these handlooms will go tax-free for you, because tax-free essentially means in the... in the shelf, it is easily accessible for the common people. That's what... that's why I'm saying tax-free. Uh, because... Sadhguru... Sorry. Yes. Please tell me. So, uh, firstly, given the GST co composition in our country, uh, today to get the credit back, in fact, is more beneficial for any company or anybody who has an enterprise. But I must say, uh, Sadhguru, that in the past four years that I've had this responsibility, we have connected with two very big design associations of our country. One is the Fashion Design Council of India, and the other is the LACME Fashion Week team. And we have, in fact, engaged with some of the most celebrated designers, in fact, taken some of them to the handloom cluster, introduced them with the weavers to say that now if you want to purchase some cloth or design with a new intent, kindly directly continue your engagement with them. And I'm happy to note that both these councils, in fact, did special initiatives, not only nationally, but also internationally, to bring these weaves and these weaving opportunities to a larger market base. I must also here declare that we have in the past four years engaged with over 22 e-commerce companies, national and international, uh, which includes Flipkart, which includes Amazon, which includes retails like Raymond's, uh, Arvind Mills, Biba, 
in fact one of the most uh, memorable events as textile minister was when the brand allen solly uh, because of our initiative to source directly from the weaver ended up even intricately making mother of pearl buttons for men's shirt that is the amount of love that a multinational company suddenly showed because we brought about that engagement directly with the weaving community i still remember when biba a brand which is so successful uh, picked up over 2 and 1/2 lakh meters of crore directly from a pochupalli cluster so we have in the past 4 years not only ensured that we are increasing consumer consciousness engaging more with weavers directly digitally ensuring that governance means become more transparent but we have not uh, divorced it our entire process of engagement from the design community we've been quite blessed that be it the uh, elephanta caves or in delhi uh, the red fort we've had some of the best designers of our country come forth and engage with our weavers we have done that but i'm conscious that much more needs to be done because as guru we want to make handloom not only better designed but also better priced we know that when a cloth is woven by a designer of great repute it comes at a huge price tag and we know that buyers for that particular category are very limited our endeavor is to also ensure as you have rightfully said about school uniforms that it becomes an everyday affordable article also for more indians so that our weavers get a bigger market so that is one dimension i'm glad that uh, that is being addressed that is the designers who produce high value uh, products but also at a different level in tamil nadu for example in erode this tex valley is the largest uh, wholesale uh, you know textile market very innovative which is giving a physical platform for all the weavers to come there and have temporary marketplace it's like the old shandy but in a modern atmosphere where there is a certain security and they can store their products there and come and open their shop whenever they want they have done a fantastic job in tamil nadu similar things if they can be you know if it can be encouraged by private enterprises to do this so that there are textile markets where uh, a weaver may not aff- cannot afford to open his own shop but here there is a shop that he can open for a few days and sell his produce and go back or can store his produce there and ask some other shopkeeper to keep it not as sold but as a product to be kept there and sold for him so these kind of arrangements uh, this tex valley i think is a very innovative uh, thing i'm sure you're aware of this i think i you... will reserve my comments on that particular entity uh, but i will only say this sadguru given the challenges that the pandemic has presented everybody uh, in our country with i think the future also predominantly at least till such time that we get an early and total solution to the pandemic is uh, going to be a thrust on digital uh, i think transactions and i think that one of the challenges that we will be confronted with and currently something that we are working on through our field offices and in collaboration with state governments is how to make our weavers more digitally literate they have all the best of wares their price points are extremely competitive but there is a finesse to which a presentation uh, grabs client eyeballs and i think it's those little details that we seek support in if uh, the community sadguru uh, can reach out to the nearest weaving cluster and just help them better understand how to position themselves mm-hmm. on digital platforms and attract more attention from customers with regards to their designs and with regards to their wares i think given the pandemic currently sadguru that will be of great help to our weaving community yes uh, considering the virus pandemic i think uh, one sector that is really being hit is uh, the hand weavers because uh, i don't think too many people are thinking of buying new clothes right now <laughs> so uh, there is a big hit uh, i don't know if there are alternative ways for them to survive and things uh, i'm sure it's a hardship the, that is, is a hardship that whole uh, population of the country is facing but particularly but, for uh, sadguru mm-hmm. the imagine human ingenuity in the pandemic 
uh, came a new They're making masks, I heard. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Designer masks, and, I see. Uh, look at the beauty of collaboration, Sadhguru. We must see the Lavina's the mask. We must see Lavina's <laughs> mask. I'm sure it's a designer mask that she wears. <laughs> I've, I've Sadhguru, the, the, the collaboration. The collab. <laughs> in fact, Sadhguru, let me say this: between me and Lavina, you are better dressed today. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> But I think that Sadhguru, the ingenuity of our craftsmanship is such that on one hand, the weaver is weaving the cloth. Women in small groups are stitching it into a mask. There are some who are stylizing it and adding embellishments and paint work to it. Like the very, very popular story of a Madhubani painter mm -hmm. appealing online so that people could place orders with his entire village. And suddenly that person was flooded with the uh, orders and requests from across the country and across the world. So I think that even if we are challenged uh, by the virus, we have a weaving community, we have an artisanal community that has converted such pains into opportunities uh, also. And I'm really grateful to all the consumers, to all the customers and all the global citizens, and particularly the uh, Indian citizens online, who have reached out in these difficult times. And if not a sari, at least purchase hand-woven masks for their own <laughs> consumption. That's a wonderful thing that uh, they're doing, that ingenuity has been the uh, spirit of India, as we should know that uh, in early 90s, only some 3 to 4 percent were actually had an organized employment. Nearly 96 percent of the people were self-employed. So we are a nation like this who have been self-employed for a very long time. I don't think... I know today when we talk about economy, everybody's talking about jobs and jobs. It's distressing for me. This is just American language that you're just picking up and say, where are the jobs? Uh, I don't think India's economy in the past has ever talked about jobs. It is always talked about what can you create, what can you do, uh, not about where can you find a job. Jobs were only government jobs a little bit, rest was all enterprise. I don't think we should kill that. It's very, very important that we keep that alive and uh, pursue that path. The safety of a job uh, makes, uh, makes a human being very dull and uh, unenergetic about his own life. The safety of a job that anyway, people are talking when they join the job within five years of uh, doing their service, they're talking about their retirement benefits that they will get from the job. That's not the way for a human being to exist. Because making a living is one thing, making a life out of it is another thing. That's what is beautiful about handloom, because it's not just a way of making a living, it is about making a life out of it, and also making somebody else's life out of it, which is a very significant uh, approach. But uh, right now, as handloom industry, many things are being done. Well, this is a virus time. Uh, this is not forever, this is a period of time that we will come out of successfully, I'm sure. But uh, except for the lives that are lost, unfortunately, uh, rest, I think we will come out stronger, more resilient, more creative, more innovative than ever before. That is for sure, I have, I have the uh, trust. But one aspect I feel that could... Uh, that you as a textile ministry could pay much more attention to is... See, for example, we have... Uh, nearly 80 million tons of bagasse from the sugarcane. We are one of the big sugarcane countries. Bagasse can become a source of uh, textile, and we have uh, a huge amount of banana cultivation, particularly in southern India. Banana... Of, uh, you know, the banana plant, because it's a one-time thing, that is, only one uh, fruit will come... Uh, one uh, frond of fruit will come out. Rest is... Uh, has to be chopped down. Usually it becomes biomass, which is also a good thing, or it'll become cattle feed, but a whole lot of things are just thrown out without any kind of utilization. So, there is a fantastic amount of fiber in this, as you know. In our homes, always... you know, I know from... you know, my mother used to sit down and make these small slits, and all flowers were woven, always with the banana uh, fiber. And uh, I, I was amazed to come know that a whole lot of uh, high-value currency notes in Japan, the yen is all made with banana, banana fiber. So, uh, so bringing back banana fiber in a big way, 
and also using fiber to create high-value products, including currency, why not? We should think about it. If Japan can have banana currency, <laughs> I'm not saying this <laughs> in any negative way. Uh, we... Then the British pound, Sadhguru, is made of Indian cotton. <laughs> is that so? Yes. British pound is made of Indian cotton? Uh, oh, yes. That's nice. We had know. the textiles... Uh, we had a textiles program, Sadhguru, in Gandhinagar. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And in that, the British representative very proudly stood on stage in front of the Honorable Prime Minister and said, look at this pound. The base is Indian cotton. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> so between the yen and the pound, there are many more elements of make in India. That and we also can I've seen the banana and bamboo fabric. These are really fine fabrics. Uh, which can be brought forth, and because it's a, an agricultural by, by, byproduct, uh, this could be a significant thing about promoting uh, this uh, banana, bagas, bamboo, all the three bees could uh, contribute a lot to fine textiles from this country, which, uh, which will be definitely of uh, international grade. And uh, if designers can focus on this, if some investments can be made in that direction, it would be really wonderful because these are tree-based fibers which can be grown. And also, during the Nixon era, it happened that they asked Indian governments to uh, burn down all the hemp cultivation in the country uh, because they could not differentiate between hemp plant and marijuana plant, which is of the same species, but not the same effect. And also, as you know, the, our partition history, which is a disastrous history, for our nation, uh, the jute industries got destroyed because uh, the jute cultivation was on one side and the industry on the other side, and we completely destroyed it. So though we still claim 70% of the jute uh, production is in our country, the usage is not uh, grown as it should. Jute fabrics can be fantastic, it's not just a sack, it can be done in a very beautiful way, and there is no b better nation Nations than India, Bangladesh, together we can evolve something where jute products could go in a big way, or India itself is a large enough country to do this by itself, because we still have a generation which knows immense knowledge about these things, because this is a knowledge that you acquire over centuries. You can drop it in five days, or you can drop it in a few years, but to acquire that, it'll take a long time. No other culture can suddenly pick up knowledge about jute, grow jute, and make jute products but we are capable of that. All these uh, products which are unique to this culture, we must exploit that because uh, nobody else can do that. If you can have a product in this world which doesn't have competition for the next 20, 30 years, is a big, big possibility because everything else is in serious competition always. Sadhguru, you are right when you talk about the diversity of uh, the raw material that we have in our country. I'm delighted to share with you that many designers now are experimenting and successfully so and have found a client base with regards to banana fabric, with regards to bamboo silk and even cloth made out of hemp. So that is now the buzzword in the sustainable community and clientele. But I must here uh, also bring to your kind notice the uh, diversification possibilities in jute, as you rightfully said. It is not meant only for sacking, but sadly so, it is limited to sacking Sadhguru because the farming community does not get certified seeds. Bangladesh, which also produces jute, but lesser quantity of jute, has enhanced its quality of jute based on certified Indian seeds. In fact, when I received this responsibility in textile ministry, I had a conversation with my senior counterpart in the Ministry of Agriculture Agriculture, because state governments have a large role to play, we implored with all the states, especially one state, the state of West Bengal, which has 70% of the jute, raw jute output, to ensure each farmer has access to certified seeds. We were not very successful in communicating the needs of the farmer. And that is why in the next coming seven days, Sadhguru, we have undertaken under the National Jute Board an initiative to ensure that the certified seeds needed by the jute farming community is provided for directly in collaboration with the National Seed Corporation. 
But I must say, say Sadhguru, that every year the government of India only for sacking gives valued orders at five thousand five hundred crores, mm -hmm. and the companies which get five thousand five hundred crores worth of orders are only a hundred and twenty-five. We have, in fact, when we came into this position of service, spoke to those companies and said that you have a ready order of five and a half thousand crores every year. Why is it that the jute farmer and the jute labor never gets paid? Ah, uh, there were some murmurs here and there, and that is when we decided that if you want the government order of five thousand five hundred crores every year, you will ensure that you pay the jute farmer and the jute labor before get that certification from that farmer and labor that there are no dues, and then you shall continue <laughs> to get government orders. And Sadhguru, I'm happy to report to you. that after that intervention after many years we've had farmers and labor tell us that because of this intervention and this insistence of the government today we have companies who have all dues paid only then that they can work with the government of india but the good news behind jute is sadguru in the last budget we announced for the first time with the blessings of the prime minister the national technical textile mission and one of the technical textiles is geotech jute sadguru ji in the past 4 years we have had it certified by the indian road congress when it is used as a base to build roads the life of that road goes up by 5 years we now have that research certified secondly we have used jute cloth to ensure that in hilly areas we contain landslides and successfully now that practice has been shared by all hilly states thirdly sadguru the prime minister has announced the jal shakti mission which encourages making of more and more ponds at the village level in all states of the country and the lining of such water bodies is jute based so we have reached out to all states mm -hmm. we have reached out to all authorities that are either in construction of roads or water bodies to encourage diversified prospects of jute because as you rightly said sadguru till such time we do not encourage commercial opportunities no diversification process or effort will bear fruit yes uh you know like uh, these uh, tree based uh, things and also the fiber cultivation as such as all of us know the struggles that indian farmer has been going through and uh, unfortunate uh, suicide uh, incidents across the country for variety of reasons but one fundamental reason is because farmers are completely invested in growing regularly monoculture agriculture and all perishable items but if 30% if we envisage in the next 10 years or so by 2030 if 30% of the land is dedicated to fiber cultivation a huge relief would come to the farmer because now he has a product which is not perishable where there is uh, more opportunity to market it in a lucrative way rather than desperately put it out in the market so uh, if we evolve a policy towards this at least a certain percentage of the land i am saying 30% out of my concern but whatever is a practical percentage if it goes under a variety of fiber cultivation there used to be one thing in which is called as the malabar silk cotton trees uh, when we were growing up you know if you don't pluck them they would be all over flying all over the place it was lot of fun for the kids to chase them in the air but i think these days those trees have completely disappeared i don't know much about it but looking at the finish of the fiber as it is the way it is fine fiber because right now i see one reason why the banaras uh, weavers are using nearly 40% of the chinese silk and stuff is because they feel it's lighter but making it light clothing which is light like that hand woven but still light like that i think uh, that particular fiber would do i am not an expert on this but from my experience of chasing chasing these fibers in the air as a child i saw that they were so fine much finer than the silk and as i told you i was also been a mulberry farmer and a sericulture uh, farmer so i know how silk is and how fine it is but the rough uh, the raw silk that we are producing is not is a bit heavy that was the beauty of the cloth but unfortunately the modern requirements are it must be very light and fine so one important thing i'm adding one more aspect to this is it's very cruel to ask 
uh, a handmade cloth to come to the standards of machine-made cloths. Machine-made cloth, every meter is same and same and same. This will kill you with boredom one day. This machine made everything. Handmade cloth, every few inches is different and it's unique. What you wear is very unique from another meter of cloth elsewhere. But uh, the standardization process has to evolve and our aesthetics has to evolve from everything being clean and smooth, that the texture is beautiful by itself. I think uh, this texture is being appreciated in Western cultures these days, but uh, in India, people think being modern means everything must be same. So, from airlines to hospitality industry to schools, all these places, if uh, ha handmade fabric comes, I think uh, in many ways we will be presenting India in a much more aesthetic and sensible way, and also in a commercially sensible way. Sadhguru, uh, I think that you've hit the nail on the head, that everybody now wants the comfort that they presume uh, a particular modern fabric will provide to them vis-a-vis -vis the natural fabric experience. I also feel that there was a time and place uh, for a particular cloth with regards to seasons and with regards to festivals. I was fascinated, Sadhguru, where four years ago when I came into this responsibility, I know that the world over, when designs are made, every year there is a color palette. And I remember in one of my sojourns in Paris, I had asked a very, very big design house, tell me your color palette for the year. Hey, tell, us, tell us something about your modeling days. I hardly knew about that. Oh, Just recently I, hardly, I saw a picture of I you. I couldn't believe that. Look at my size, Sadhguru. <laughs> I, obviously, you would not believe it. <laughs> but uh, to just go back to that story, Sadhguru, I asked this very big design house that how do you prepare for your customer in the future? And they said, for every year, we, a year before, announce a color palette. And no matter what the make of the garment is, we play along with those designs in that color family. And I asked him about his India experience. So exasperated with that gentleman, he threw up his hands. He said, in India, you decide what you want to wear, when you want to wear it, and in what color you want to wear it. So we could never presume a color palette for you. And I was ecstatic because there was an acceptance by this connoisseur and that this ideator of designs of one of the biggest brands in the world that we were not predictable when it came to our color schemes. Not only color scheme, want... in anything we are not predictable. <laughs> 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 and I think that that is where the uniqueness of the Indian consumer tastes come into. Yes, they are evolving. Yes, there is a, a mad rush to want something which is convenient. But I also feel that the pandemic has given us a lot of time for appreciation and introspection. I think these are the times where we can engage and create more awareness. And I feel that that is where the sustainability the good living, the wellness culture, Sadhguru, that you propagate with a sense of value systems can play a huge role. The sense of appreciation, but I said affordability as well, and a sense of pride. I think when we combine all those together, we create bigger opportunities for the weaver. But I must also hear, say Sadhguru, that today one of the largest efforts that have been undertaken within the government in collaboration with state governments is to ensure that we give market intelligence from an international, globally competitive economic perspective. That today, when we talk about the handcraft potential of our country, if you look at numbers of last year, we crossed exports of over 1,30,000 crores in this segment. Mm -hmm. But That's for wonderful. too long, the stories about our communities have been of deprivation and poverty. They have never marketed the magic in the variety of our weaves. And I think that's where the focus needs to be shifted in terms of consumer consciousness and awareness. No, I do want, uh, and Sadhguru, I, I, as a former sericulturist, I must here also bring to your notice that we are now engaging with our farmers to tell them that everything with regards to sericulture is now a commercial prospect. For instance, earlier, they would throw the, uh, the waste of the silkworm 
and today we are teaching our farmers that that waste is actually being picked up by pharmacological companies for inputs into medicine making and cosmetic making so we are encouraging now farmers to understand that even the silk waste now has huge value and i also feel that sadguru when you talk about the coarseness of the garment and the desire to have something which is smooth against the skin, uh, skin one very fascinating aspect that i chanced upon is that when you go to let's say new york uh which you and i possibly you will go more uh, as compared to me and possibly between the two of us lavina has seen more of new york than we two have but when you go to let's say new york and you ask uh, anybody what is the best cotton sheets you could get they would say egyptian cotton sheets are the best that you can find and the beauty of our not discovering our own heritage and our own capacity is that the extra long staple cotton which is celebrated the world over many a times as egyptian cotton we have a similar indian cotton stream called shankars which is not known so today as you rightfully said sadguru if we encourage better farm practices for instance and i have said this on many an occasion that when our cotton farmer plucks the cotton they do it by hand many a time they will take that cotton and put it in an old fertilizer bag because of just those two steps the cotton that they pick is 60% contaminated thereby reducing the value of that hand picked cotton by 60% we are in collaboration with industry associations like city and scientific community now reaching out to cotton farmers across the country sadguru giving them plucking machines which without contamination now can give them more value for their crop we are also encouraging growth of extra long staple cotton today if we concentrate particularly on growth of extra long staple cotton sadguru the us market in itself and the eu market will present us with an 80 billion dollar opportunity but this is a long process it falls under the ambit of agriculture and there is a huge role to play by states but i wanted to bring this to this conversation because i want citizens of our country and the global community sadguru that is beholden to you to understand the latent undiscovered potential of our ecology and our farm systems so uh, one important thing is uh, wherever you go in the world everybody is talking about organic cotton so this certification for what is organic and what is not uh if we make this india certification process compliant with the international standards and it is acceptable to uh, international audience i think that would be a big step for india's cotton to go where it has to <laughs> this may be very funny i am just remembering these things now so uh, looking at you i also invested myself in growing cotton at one time i do i took out two crops and uh, then i did cotton seed development you know this uh, it's a very intensive process i actually physically involved myself in doing cotton seed production but then i decided because that whole area the merchants who were coming were so blatantly deceiving on the weight of the cotton i decided to <laughs> take up the cause of a few farmers and transport their cotton to erode which was the only market i was growing this near mysore but i was wanting to transport so i took five truck loads of cotton really loaded it's everybody's cotton including mine and there <laughs> i must tell you this harassment fortunately i think with the gst these problems are gone now at the forest gate they stop and say you are smuggling sandalwood i said no such thing we just want to go to the market he says no i want to check unload the cotton now in the forest he is asking me to unload five truck loads of cotton and if you unload it you're finished because you can never load it back it takes a lot to load cotton because the volume is more weight is less we stand on it press it press it and take it down and this is a simple trick that this guard says unload the cotton i just want to check if you have sandalwood inside so the only way out you know what is the way out fortunately with the gst probably these problems are gone at the state entrance uh, the trucks need not stop and need to be checked and all that stuff is largely history now having said that 
Now that region which was growing cotton in Karnataka has completely given it up because of these kind of harassments and of course there were some diseases, cotton related diseases to the plants. But I think the harassment was one important aspect which destroyed cotton cultivation in the area, though it is reasonably black cotton region, which uh, should have thrived. So I'm saying these kind of bottlenecks are there everywhere. If there is a portal somewhere where fiber cultivation farmers can put their problems in one place and somebody can periodically look at it and see whether it's a policy change or it is just an administrative, uh, you know, little force, uh, from you, I'm sure you can uh, clear the bottlenecks anywhere. <laughs> Sadhguru, you expect the impossible from me, from which I'm grateful. But uh, I must say a highlight in the beginning of this conversation. Um, Guruji, you had spoken about the agricultural reform that has been undertaken under the leadership of the Prime Minister. And the intent behind that agricultural reform was to ensure that farmers are no longer... Um, deliberately chained to certain market systems that in one country it has to be the choice of the farmer where they want to sell their bears i think with the advent of gst and especially with the prime minister's guidance and nitin gadkari ji's direction the tagging of movement of all such transport uh, goods vehicles i think will bring about a huge welcome change i also feel that uh, under the cotton corporation of india which is a PSU under the textiles ministry, we do the uh, MSP operations for cotton buying so that we can protect the farmer from market fluctuations and from uh, price uh, competitors, uh, competitiveness, which might harm the farmer instead. And I'm happy to share with you that four years ago, when we tried to correct the systems five years ago, one of the greatest challenges, and as you have said from your own experience, was the thakpatti that the farmer would get and then never get that money and lose two, three cycles and then be submerged in debt. What we brought about as a change in the system was to ensure that the farmer gets the money directly transferred into their accounts and that we do not encourage any middleman. And because of that, Sadhguru, the biggest MSP operations for cotton happened in this particular year. In mm -hmm. fact, the crop pattern now is such that more and more farmers want to go back to cotton farming because they're getting their wajib dam directly from the government without any middle person. In 72 hours, it's in their bank accounts. So I think the agricultural reform that you spoke about is a reform that was much needed and much was much awaited. But I think that also there has to be, as you have said, certification processes is something that the Commerce Ministry has undertaken not only certification, but we've also engaged with the Commerce Ministry to ensure that the branding of Indian cotton and Indian fiber and fabrics is something that we can have a larger engagement with the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of External Affairs. And both my colleagues, Piyush Goel and Jay Shankarji, have been more than kind. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful to hear all the things that are happening on the handloom sector, which has been the pride of India in the ancient uh, India, that uh, we had the pride of clothing the world. But uh, today, India had a, has a latitudinal spread from Kanyakumari to Kashmir. Uh, and over 60% of the population is still involved in agriculture. Uh, so both in terms of uh, feeding the world and clothing the world, we're, uh, you know, uh, immensely capable, but this relaxing, of farmers being able to take their produce wherever they want to, which I've been pushing for for many years now, unfortunately it's come true just now, is a fantastic thing because only then it will develop as a genuine industry. Like any other industry, they can produce, sell their produce wherever they want. This freedom was very, very needed. This, uh, I don't know, most people may not, uh, might not have noticed it or might not have taken seriously in being very connected with rural India, in my way of looking at things, in a way it is a new freedom that's happened to the nation, that a farmer that is 60% of the country's population now has the freedom to earn their living the way they want, the way they are competent to do it, not the way somebody decides it. I Giving, giving uh, with all due respect for whatever policies that were made in the past, 
Probably in the past these rules were made considering there used to be uh, famines. Famine control rules were made so that food transportation is limited to certain uh, geographical limitations. Now that famines are over here, history, they're never going to happen in our country again. Because of that, this move that farmers can take their produce where they want, they can grow what they want in a given place, and above all, giving support prices to various crops, not just to rice, wheat, and sugar cane, which became like, uh, you know, very thirsty crops, all of them, not suitable for many regions, but everybody went for it, whether it's suitable or not, simply because there's a support price. So this support price, if it comes to fibers also, it'll be fantastic. I strongly feel at least 30% of India's land should go under fiber cultivation and in tandem with uh, hand loom and uh, natural fiber industry growing. So on this uh, National Hand Loom Day, uh, congratulations for many things you've achieved, but we have big expectations out of you what you will do for the hand loom industry in future. And it's great that I don't know how it was thought through that uh, hand loom and uh, the textile and this woman and child being put under one person, I think that's very innovative and insightful because 75 percent of uh, the people employed in this sector are women. So as an economic process for women, this is a very significant step that both are under the same, they're not the same ministry, but under the same person, at least under the same minister. That's a fantastic move and I'm sure it'll pay off uh, long term. Thank you very much, uh, Smriti, and uh, wonderful, and wish you the very best for the coming years that are in front of you. And I'm sure uh, we will come up with more innovative ways of doing things post-pandemic. And Lavina, whatever you wish to say, wonderful of you. I'm so sorry we kept you quiet. We got too engaged in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that was the whole idea, Sadhguru. And thank you so much. Thank you, Smriti ji, and thank you, Sadhguru, for this conversation. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of possibilities that have opened and with all your new ideas we are looking for a very bright future thank you wonderful uh, are you still in hampi uh, lavina or absolutely i am <laughs> originally months. i am originally from hampi yeah <laughs> so here we are thank you very much wonderful thank you thank you, thank you. all thank the you. best for you blessings namaskar namaskar namaskar